Obviously, in accordance with all government regulations, the first thing is the health and safety. So, uh, <laughs> so that's our warning. <coughs> Cover your nuts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Got over the funny part. But no, no. Send you all to sleep. No? So. Good grief, John! You really went in all out on oh, this. Wow. Brief history, invented about 400 BC by Archidae. He's a met. He was a um, pupil of Plato. The Greeks have been screwing us for 2,500 years. <laughs> so that's a good. One. Did the screw come before the bolt? <laughs> Well, the Almost, the yes. The bolt, or the screw. The screw. Yeah. Okay, I mean nut. like a point, you know, like a wood screw before yeah. well, a bolt. And when you think of a screw, and a water water screw. I forgot to get it out. It's but an inclined plane. That's what the screw is. It's a helix. Yeah, yeah. Hmm? Okay. okay. That is. Yeah. The screw thread is a helix. So if you take a rod, yeah. wind a piece of string around it, and look at the shape of the string, it's a helix. That's the basic thread is. Mm -hmm. So this guy came up with one, and what I can't understand is how they actually made them freehand, but they did. Of course, you move on another 100 years to 300 BC, so Kuran Archimedes developed the screw principle for lifting water. Again, it's a wooden structure, with a helix on it, but it's a thread. So then, not a lot happened until the Industrial Re Revolution in the 18th century. So various people were, came up with different methods of making threads. And uh, one guy in the 1700s, made a screw for moving a lathe toolpost and then another guy a little later on in the early 1800s or 1700s he developed a way of cutting a thread but there was no standardization so everyone was turning out different threads well once the industrial revolution was underway something needed to be standardized. So Sir Joseph Whitworth um, looked at a load of different threads that were being made and proposed a standardization of thread in 1841. And that became the Whitworth thread, which is the coarse thread. About the same time, or just after that, in good old USA, William, what's his name? William Sellers proposed another standard, which is what everyone knows as the American UNF, UNC, or SAE as it's known, or even AF, it's called Cross Flats. So, That was done, and then at the same time, in France and continental Europe, metric thread standards were being developed. So it all happened in the mid-1800s in amongst the Industrial Revolution. You end up with the threads that everyone is familiar with now, but gets totally confused about, because what the hell are they? So, Basic thread terms, because this will come up. So, your pitch is ob obvious. Half a pitch is often quoted. But the crest and the root shapes are important to different thread forms. 
and then you've got the minor diameter which is the inside of the thread the major diameter which is the outside obviously and what they call the pitch diameter which is halfway up that's terminology still weak yep uh, i never thought of a thread being so complicated it's yeah. many, isn't that well okay. yeah it's <clears throat> it's interesting that the press is flat I guess I'll have to stop forcing them when they don't quite fit. Yeah. We'll come to that. So, basically, there are 13 different types of thread. So, standard threads are right hand, you've got left hand threads, taper threads, V shaped threads, metric or international threads. Pretty standard threads, cellar threads, which is the UNF UNC, square threads and Acme threads. They're very similar. The square thread is exactly what it is. The, the sides are square. They're made for high loading, like same as the Acme, which is used in a lot of um, crossfeed screws on, like on the lathe. And, Bead screws. It's used on decent G cramps, not the cheaper ones with the fine threads on that are useless. So it's for a high load use. Then there's buttress threads, which is a, a V shape. So again, it takes a, quite a load. One that I didn't know existed turns out the knuckle thread and it looks like a, a knuckle. Weird looking thing. I don't know what they used it for. And then worm threads. Those are like on your oil pumps, two start, three start. So then there's single and multi threads, which are your, like your worm with two or three starts on them. So if you look at a AJ oil pump drive, the, you'll see two S on the end of the oil pump, which means two start. You get to a commando, the oil pump drive there is up to six start. Well, so, no. Okay, so what's the difference in that? Does that alter the reflection <coughs> speed of the, speed. Drip, of the driven? Yeah, yeah. Oh. so it picks up quicker because it's got two starts. Oh, You're not okay. waiting for it to come all the way round and start again. Oh, okay. It's got a second one that it can go to. Hmm. Oh, sorry, sir. Oh, oh, oh gosh, yeah. Are <laughs> <laughs> <Sounded> we good? Yeah. <laughs> Just uh, gotta grab my boots here. <laughs> sorry, gentlemen. Yeah. We're missing the soundtrack. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it back. Okay. <laughs> Right, so thread details. Um, metric threads, thread angle is 60 degrees, like UNF and UNC. The screw is flat and its root is round. So the outside of the screw edge is flat, but the inside, the root, is rounded. So it has two different shapes. Then you come on to British Standard Whitworth. Thread angle is 55 degrees. Crest and root are round. It's known as BSW. Now, prior to the war, a BSW nut had the head size was one size bigger than the equivalent diameter BSF bolt. But in the war, they were saving materials, they went to the same. So if you look at a spanner now, you see it says the 916th Whitworth, 916th W. 
but it then says 5 8 BS. It doesn't say BSF because they're all post war. It's very rare to find a Whitworth nut that's the larger size. So if you're working on three war bikes, you would need <clears throat> that you find that more commonly. Well, it's the same size spanner, you've just got to go one size up. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Now British yeah, yeah. BSF BSW spanners are um, the sizes give, given to them are based on the diameter of the bolt. Same as metric. So you see M10 on it, it's a 10 mil bolt. So you see 5 sixteenths on a BS bolt or spanner, it's a 5 16 diameter bolt. Just looks like a 9 16 match. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> fit though. There's only one that does. 1737. <laughs> yeah, 17, yeah, 17 and quarter are the mm. same. Nothing else is. So, pretty standard fine. Yeah. Again, the angle is 55, press the root around. Obviously, it's got a greater number of threads per inch, and it's known as BSF. Now, do they match the pitches from Whitworth? Are they... Yeah, the pitch is still 55. But the number, like the, the actual number? No, the threads. They don't they are a finer pitch. So okay. up here are a set of 5/16 BS bolts. So there's a Whitworth, a BSF, and a cycle. And compare that to a 5/16 coarse and fine in America, and a 10 mil, or sorry, 8 mil metric. The other one is a BA, but we'll get to that later. Okay, I was just curious because the round, I didn't know yeah. it was too round. Kind of. Well, on quarter BSF and quarter cycle, they're both 26 TPI. But on some of them, they won't run up because of the shape is slightly different. So if it tightens up, you've got the wrong nut on a quarter bolt. But a lot of times they fit because they're made so sloppily nowadays. That they're interchangeable. <sighs> so then you've got cycle. Cycle is 60 degrees as opposed to 55. Crest and root are round. That's the same. And bolt sizes up to half inch are normally 26 TPI on all of them. Once you get over half inch, you'll often find that there are 20 TPI equivalents as well. There are the odd one where all of a sudden 24 TPI creeps in. And then you start cursing because who used the American pitch on this bloody bolt? <laughs> So, yeah, there's all sorts of variations, but there are three distinct sizes of thread. So when everyone normally says, oh, that's got Whitworth bolts on it, it probably hasn't got a single Whitworth bolt on it because the thread is too coarse. It rattles loose. It'll have BSF and it'll have cycle, but it won't have Whitworth. On occasion, there is a Whitworth bolt on a bike, but it's normally BSF and cycle. And so cycle, British cycle was known as cycle, CEI, Cycle Engineers Institute, or BSC. What about the British car industry? Did they use cycle thread on the car? Or that cycle was just for the motorcycle industry? Mainly for the motorcycle and push bike industry. Oh, okay. In the car industry, they used all sorts of different things until after the war, 
when most car manufacturers were using UNF and UNC type bolts, except for one manifold, one group of companies that used they used American sized nut heads and bolt heads, but the threads were metric. Threads were metric? Yeah. <laughs> Don't ask me why, I have no idea, but... And that was the British car industry? Yes. Okay. They must have had something left over or got something from the war, I don't know, but it, it was terrible. You, when you went to work on these, yeah, you, what on earth have I got? Do you think they were originally all the American threads and then they got retooled? Or no, I, on, I don't know. Factory? <laughs> I don't know what it was, but there is yeah, one group, and I can't remember what the group is, that had this bastardized thread system. And they used it for quite a while until so everyone made them come to their senses. Yeah. I wonder why the British industry failed. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> now, then you've got British Association or BA threads. Now, these are small and tiny electrical and mechanical uses. So you'll find them in magnetos, the screws holding your tank badges on, um, odd places. Now, the largest size is what is called OBA, and that is just under a quarter of an inch. And it goes all the way down to 12 BA. But now, which is like a hair thickness. But these were used by model engineers, steam engineers, and stuff like that. So, just to confuse everyone, the thread angle was 47 and a half degrees, so nothing else would fit in it. Actually, if you're careful and you've got two BA screws in your tank badges, then you, there's not a hope in hell of finding two BA screws hardly anywhere around Winnipeg. You might find them here, but uh, <laughs> this, uh, you can actually tap it out with a five mil tap. It takes so little metal out, and you can use a five mil screw in them. Because they're cheap, well they were. Um, raised head screws countersunk normally for holding your badges on and yeah everyone will just look at you in totally blank deer in the headlights when you, if you go and try and get those off a bolt so of all the screws in the, there are the When you're cutting a thread on these, it's often the hardest thread to cut because the um, dies tend to dull off very quickly. So you can get some rather ugly results if, when you're trying to use the die cutter on them. It tells you when you need a new, new die. So that's BA. Then you've got British Standard Pipe, BSP. Comes in two different forms, parallel and tapered. So your tapered is used on most plumbing applications. So this here, if you look at it after, this is a plumber's BSP die cut. You can set it to all the different sizes by just moving this around and it alters the diameter. It's not going to move now, is it? 
So well, that's the rig you see it. Uh, the guys have got a big pipe in it. Yeah. They're usually cutting thread. And that's what that one does. <laughs> BSP you'll find on your um, oil unions and gas taps on a British bike. So there's a couple of different sizes. BSP is measured by the nominal bore diameter of the pipe. So just to confuse everyone, that is an 8th BSP, because the pipe size is an 8th, but That's bigger. I could be a quarter. Then they go up, again it's 3 8 BSP. So, it's got a standard thread angle of 55 degrees. It's known as BSP, BSPF, which is still parallel, or P. They've changed the F to a P to avoid confusion now. And BSPT, which is tapered. Now this thread is internationally accepted for plumbing fittings all over the world, except for a little island called America, <laughs> which adopted its own national pipe thread, <clears throat> and of course it's got a 60, 60 degree thread angle. So you can force them in, but don't take them out, especially if it's in an alloy case. <laughs> yeah, so that's why when you try and jo join up your um, Swedish plumbing fittings to your American, it doesn't always work. That's PSP. And of course you've got cellar threads, which is, the, that's the guy's name, <coughs> which not, not many people know, known as American National Threads. Thread angle is 60. The root and, the root and crest are flat. Comes in two forms, coarse and fine. Commonly known as UNF and UNC, also known as AF and SAE. So, spanners for that. Just say the size. They never say that it's American or UNF. It's just got a size on it. So, if you buy a, an American tap set, and the die, the die will cut threads and give you uh, a flat root and crest? Yeah. It will. Okay. Yeah, that's the big difference. So in, on the Whitworth threads and the <clears throat> coarse threads here, you'll find that some of the nuts will interchange with the bolts. And then all of a sudden they get very tight because of the angle. So the, the form looks very similar between that and that. The number of threads per inch is the same. But the thread angle is, yeah, thread angle is enough. Once you start winding the bolt, nut on the bolt, you think, oh, this is good. And it starts to tighten yeah, up. Yeah, got it. You've got the wrong yeah. one. But the clue should be the fact that the spanner, on it. the spanner sizes are different. Same with UNF, which is quite often 24 TPI, as opposed to 26 cycles. So they don't match up at all. But it's amazing how many times you find that people have managed to wind one of these onto one of those. And then you've got to find another bolt. And it, it starts. Yeah, it'll just take the threads off. It'll lock yeah, up nicely. It'll probably go in one or two turns yeah. and that's it. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can only get it on further if you really try. You see a little. <coughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the difference. So screw threads. And I'm not going to go through every one, I'm just going to do the ones that are common to most motorcycles. So standard threads, they have a they have higher strength and they have manufacturability. But then you've got rolled threads, which are you'll find them on bicycles. So this one was a stem handlebar stem bolt off of my school that someone wound into something else and took the threads off but they would have been raised threads originally these rolling threads you find them on spokes the diameter of the roll is greater than the diameter of the metal because it's rolled them it's pressed the metal out and it's that tool you would use to roll spokes this is an, um, I think this is 9BA. So it has three thread rollers. So rolled is not cutting. No. It's compressing. It, and yeah, it just wow. moves the okay. metal out. So the hardness of the, the bolt or the screw is, must be important then. <laughs> yeah. So rolled threads, it's high production low cost, but increased strength. They don't strip off in the same way as cut threads. <clears throat> so, that's as far as I got with writing. Well, actually, I'm press getting my daughter into writing. I write very small. I'm trying to write big. I was going to compliment you on your printing. <laughs> That's <laughs> not yours. Yeah. No, my daughter did. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I like refer to it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I said my writing is very, very small. Mm -hmm. And once I start writing big, it looks terrible. <laughs> is she a teacher? Or? She used to be a teacher's aide for uh, uh, <laughs> special needs kids. Yeah. Only one spelling mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you you have to report. Yeah. 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 Was, the H was dropped off thread oh. about four sheets. Yeah. Don't tell her. No, no. no she just got me with John right now. That's yeah. all. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's all. Yeah. It cost me some hanging baskets. So I had to go and buy. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and what are you using these? Ah, so coming to that. Okay. So, one of the other things that is very important with nuts and bolts is locking mechanisms. So, here you've got three different types of Thackeray washer, spring washer, and then various design of nuts. So everyone nowadays knows the nylock nut, which is the common lock. Prior to that was the steel lock nut, which had slots cut in the side. And then this was just bent over. So a similar example here is a Triumph big end nut has the same principle where you can see the top is being beat down. Castellated nuts. And then the old fashioned way. Take an ordinary nut, make two taxor cuts in it, cut them down, you've got a lock nut. Easy. But 
Oh, and does that mean more? And the, and the more you tap it down, the tighter it is. What do you yeah. mean by tap it down? Where you've, like, where you've cut the two cuts, yeah. you just tap it down, close the gap up. Um, and so that closes the thread up, acts as a locker. Yeah, Benji, you making a lock now. Or was it in there many bigger examples? Now, of all the, the locking bit, these things are useless. Tests have been done, they were used for years, but they don't actually improve any of your security. Thackeray washers have a slightly better chance, but they should only be used once. When they're all flat, they won't do a thing. So they've got to still have all their little teeth on them to actually work. So you can see it's quite a quite a shape to the teeth. One of the other common methods of securing nuts from vibration is use the lock nut system. Two nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Jam nut in your vocabulary. Okay. Question. When you use the lock nut, which nut do you put on first? The thin one or the thick one? I always put the thick one on first. What? You're going to tell me that's not right. Correct. I've, whenever I've <laughs> done it, I've used the same nut twice. But yeah. <laughs> I didn't notice <laughs> the difference. Yeah. So you get the, the thin lock nuts and the standard oh. nut whip and most people put the thin nut on the top whereas if you think about it you put the thin nut on you can't actually do it up as tight but then you lock it up really tight with the thick nut on top so that's incorrect or what you're saying now is correct yes the oh. thin nut goes on the bottom so you get the full torque yeah. on the top yeah. nut which you can't apply to the thin nut oh okay so that's the way it should go right there are occasions when you put them on the other way around of course there are but in the in the main the correct way is thin then thick hmm. so that's another silly um, okay going back to the washers that spring washer, lock washer, if uh, if they are so ineffective, how come they've been so widespreadly wide, widespread usage? Well, it was only once they started doing um, scientific testing on these washers. Oh. Um, so it was a theory, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was all they were used pre-war everywhere. Yeah, yeah post-war okay. they were also used, but by the well, it looks like a good idea. Yeah. You think it would be, yeah. but of course, when these are flattened down, the sharp edge flat. becomes flat. So there's there's no, no mechanical holding, advantage no to holding it. power. No, that's the reason why these are now considered obsolete. I mean, I still use them because all the studs you've got on the bikes are long enough to take them, and if you try and use the small ones or don't use them, you know. The, you run out of stud. Any but, idea how uh, Loctite is in effectiveness compared to? Well, Loctite is the modern equivalent. Oh, okay. These these are more what you would find on your antique motorcycles. Right. I mean, we all use Loctite now as if it's going out of style. Yeah, I don't know. Better put a bit on that. Just lock the bearings it in. Just, yeah, just it works. Case, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but this was <clears throat> old school, really. So, um, if you want to make it look as if you're using all the right parts, you can use a spring washer but then put Loctite on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Suspenders? Yeah. 
<laughs> no buildings. <laughs> so it's it's only in the last I suppose fifty years, thinking about it, that people have actually researched this type of thing with the advent of all your different um, Loctites and fluids with different things. You know, there's been a lot of testing on bolts and nuts. Because, I mean, it's the most common fixing you'll find anywhere. For something that's got to come apart, you use a nut and bolt. If it's not going to come apart, it's probably riveted or welded. Mm -hmm. So your most common fastener is your nut and bolt. It's just knowing which bolt you've got in your hand to, to look for the right nut. So one of the things that is very important when you're trying to figure out what the bolt is, is your thread gauge. So obviously you put it on the bolt and you can find out what the TPI is and then you can reference it to your different bolts, find out what you've actually got most of the time. It doesn't always work, but it's there. But when you're dealing with BA nuts and bolts, magnetos, this is what's called a set of mag spanners. So it has a feeler gauge on it. A little screwdriver which is not used and your sizes what's this one from from naught to six basically so you that's if you're doing any mag work, a set of mag spanners is an absolute must. So, any questions? Anyone awake? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Your thread gauges have an indication on the root shape too? Like the, do you have, are well, the Whitworth ones rounded to actually know whether they're fitting yeah, down? Yeah, you see, this, this is a set of British um, ones. You can see that, on especially on the larger ones, you can see the root is round. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Everything I've got, of course, is down to the square bottom. And, yeah. So. I don't have a metric set. <laughs> And do you have a source in Manitoba when you want to get British standard uh, bolts, nuts, or anything? Is there anywhere here, like a Ken Catton or something that I that that is knowledgeable about it or, or has stock? I don't really know of anyone here. Occasionally, someone will turn up. I think there's someone, some in the states, but. I normally find that I can buy what I need out of Britain a lot easier than I can anywhere else. So when I go back to Britain, go to a swap meet, I'll normally buy up mm -hmm. a so selection, of, yeah, yeah. selection yeah. of bolts. Yeah. Back. Cans. Yeah. Cans. Okay. Maybe you guys got some from Tiny Shop. Nope. Nothing. No. Never tasted. Put at the can. Probably. Probably some. No. You see. Oh, the goodie boxes. This is my tap and die set. So you've got metric, cycle. BA, BSW, BSF. From eighth up to 
five eighths in there. There's the various taps go with them and of course if you're tapping any holes taps come in threes does everyone know that no. so you've got a number one number two and a club so the number one See, it has a taper to it, mm -hmm. so you can guide it in, get it straight. The number two has a start to it, but then it's straight. And the number three doesn't have any start because that's for a plug, because it's in a blind hole. So you want to get to the bottom of the hole. So you need to thread right to the end. Mm -hmm. So, I have taps and dies going up to one inch cycle, including 20 TPI ones. So, if I need a nut and bolt, you'll probably find me making it rather than um, buying it because you, there's no way here. Can you tell us about your Donnell's nut? Oh, yes. <laughs> so, the, yeah. The Donnell's there. I, um, I got frame and forks from Finland and I got some other fork parts from Britain. And between the two, I managed to complete the girders, except I was one nut short, which turned out to be a 7 16th BSF left hand thread. Oh, what? Where am I going to find one of those? So I'm going well. Maybe I can modify something else, change the thread on the stud. And then I remembered about probably about 35 years ago. I had to buy. left hand tap that's rare well yeah it's the only one I've got well no I've got a couple of others but it's the only BSF left hand tap I've got which just happens to be 7 sixteenths. so I completed the forks <laughs> I had a piece of hex steel that came out of a snowblower here um, years ago, someone gave me this old snowblower attachment that I never used in the end because the drive was stripped. And when I scrapped it, I just, well, it was a nice hunk of steel, you know, as you do, I'll hang on to that. It was the right size hex for 716 BSW, BSF. So, Donald is a little bit of a project. If and when I complete it, there will be only one of four known in the world that are left. There are 500, but the 600 side well is 10 steeps. 